Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for our PRC Saltillo guest webinar. I'm Heather Prenevo, Saltillo AT consultant and training implementation team member. I'll be moderating today as well as Beth Waitliff-Fever. We're excited to have Abby Marks, Sarah Marshall, and Kat Cantor with us today to talk about benefits that they've found in providing AAC service through telepractice. Um, they're going to discuss the barriers to telepractice and propose some potential solutions for assessment, treatment, and parent coaching um, that have been crucial for AAC success. We do have a few housekeeping details, so uh, we're going to go through those here at the beginning. The next slide, if you're having any trouble hearing or connecting to the webinar, try logging out and back in um, to GoToWebinar. If that still doesn't work, you may need to restart your computer or contact log me in at the number you see on the screen. Handouts can be found in the handout section of the toolbar, the gray off to the right hand side of your screen. Uh, you can download those to follow along with. There is a question um, chat window that you are able to type your questions into and we will address them but with the presenters at the end if time permits. In order to receive ASHA credit for their participation on our next slide, you do have to be on all day or all hour, my pardon. Um, the ASHA instructions and forms are as part of your handouts. Remember um, to put today's date on that form as we use that to identify the correct course number. And some other reminders are um, staying online the whole time. It does timestamp, so if you do have to log in and out due to the um, audio issues, um, it's okay. It'll be timestamped for you. Please include the title of the class and the date in the subject line of the email when you submit those forms. Um, and you'll email those to info at printrom.com. You will receive an email from PRC Saltillo um, via GoToWebinar tomorrow. Um, this will have a link to the recording of this webinar, the handouts, the ASHA forms and instructions, as well as a certificate of attendance. Please allow a full 24 hours for this to be sent out before reaching out to us at PRC Saltillo. Um, you must submit your ASHA participation form within 15 days. If you don't use the ASHA CEU registry, um, you'll just be able to use the certificate of attendance for any um, hours that you need. Finally, there will be a feedback survey that will pop up as you leave the webinar. Um, your input is valued and we would hope that you would take a, just a couple of minutes to share your thoughts on the webinar with us and any other presentation ideas you have for the future. And the next slide. So Abby and Sarah and Kat have listed their financial and non-financial disclosures um, for you here on the slide. This is available for 0.1 ASHA CEUs. And just as a note, PRC Saltillo is a proud sponsor of this guest webinar as a platform for sharing information. Please note that the content presented in the webinar has been created by the presenters and as such may um, not reflect the views or opinions of PRC Saltillo or their employees. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Abby, Sarah, and Kat. We appreciate you being here and um, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Heather. We are gonna do a quick round robin of introductions since there are three of us today and then I will get us started. Sorry if there's a little bit of delay in the slides. Um, so I will go first. My name is Sarah Marshall and actually all three of us today are speech language pathologists from the Weissman Center and we have the opportunity to practice exclusively in the area of augmentative and alternative communication, serving individuals across the lifespan. Kat? Hi, I'm Kat Cantor and like Sarah said, we all work at the Weissman Center. I'm excited to kind of meet you all today. Hi, I'm Abby. I also work at the Weissman Center in both our clinic-based and our outreach program. So we were really glad when we got the opportunity to talk about the ways that we've been using telehealth across all of those areas. And hopefully we'll give you some useful information today. Awesome, I think with that, we are gonna turn off our webcams to just support connectivity here and um, launch into things. So getting started, as I mentioned, we all work at the Weissman Center, which is Wisconsin's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, um, or USED. Um, we 
all take a role in the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic or CASC, and that's our clinic-based program. That's where we provide that direct, hands-on AAC evaluation and treatment previously in person, um, but now we have been moved to, to teletherapy, and that is how we found ourselves here today. We also offer our sister program, the Communication Development Program, which Abby was referencing, and that is an opportunity for us to provide family and team consultation and training in community settings. And then lastly, we take roles in the multidisciplinary clinics at the Weissman Center, such as the Cerebral Palsy Clinic, the Newborn Follow-Up Clinic, and we are also fortunate to provide inpatient consultations over at the Adult and Children's Hospital, which is located right across the street from us here at the Weissman Center. Some of our exciting favorite projects are our outreach and training programs, such as ECHO AAC, which is an online uh, network and learning community, and the AAC Partnership Program, where we provide free mentorship and training to community or school-based speech-language pathologists who might be new to the SGD funding process. So our learning objectives today are to discuss what barriers that we are up against as SLPs providing AAC services through telepractice. And more importantly, discuss some approaches that you can use regardless of if you're providing assessment, treatment, or parent coaching via telepractice to overcome these barriers. And lastly, with COVID, there has been so many resources made available to everybody, but it is hard to wade through them and figure out which ones are applicable to me and my caseload. And so I hope today you'll be able to start identifying which of the resources out there are relevant to your practice area. So our agenda today, I'm gonna to kick us off with assessment, and this is gonna be a really brief overview. There was a wonderful presentation yesterday um, that was a full hour focused on assessment. And so if you are providing AAC evaluations via telehealth and you were not able to attend that, I would recommend watching the recording. I will turn it over to Kat to discuss AAC treatment via telehealth. And then Abby will wrap us up with some parent and team coaching considerations and recommendations. So when we're doing an assessment, regardless of if it's in person or via telehealth, we are doing feature matching. That is where we are looking at the needs and the skills of an individual, both today and potentially in the future, as well as all the unique features and integrate um, intricacies of speech generating devices or other AAC systems, and hopefully identifying that perfect match for the individual. We're of course doing a chart review. We are doing a comprehensive interview, which includes family, the individual who is using the AAC system, school team, other support staff, job coaches, et cetera, and crucially, we're, we're conducting a dynamic assessment and trials of, at the very least, three systems. In Wisconsin and perhaps in other states, um, it is required by insurance and recommended by us that individuals complete a, at least a four-week rental period following that feature matching process. That allows the individual an opportunity to trial it across contexts, partners, settings, situations, and confirm that it really is the best match before we ask for insurance to purchase it. So before the evaluation, there's a lot of work that goes into an AAC assessment. However, when they're being done via teletherapy, I think that that work really increases. Um, we're of course completing that chart review, but I would definitely recommend beginning the interview process and completing as much as you can before even meeting the individual or beginning the process. What we need to be doing during that interview is starting to narrow down which devices to trial. When we're doing an evaluation here in person at CASC, we have an equipment room of over 40 devices, every accessory or um, switch you might need. And if I learned something in the interview that I wasn't anticipating or expecting, I can pop into that equipment room and grab what I need. But we don't have that luxury when we're completing evaluations via telehealth. And we need to start narrowing it down because we cannot mail or ship everything in the equipment room to a family. And so by completing that interview or that intake form, you can be asking yourself, is that individual gonna need accessories? What is that access method gonna be? Eye gaze, um, are they gonna be using scanning, a joystick, head pointing? Are there any vision concerns? If there's no vision concerns and somebody has no motor concerns and they might be using direct touch on a, on a tablet, great, we just eliminated a whole lot of devices that we don't need to trial. Does the individual have a history of a certain symbol set? 
Or based on their learning profile, might they need motor planning or would they benefit from full phrases? Maybe dynamic page branching to support sentence construction. And as we move into the evaluation process, I think every day we're all learning inf new information about what our fall is gonna look like. Um, some of us might be in person sometimes and teletherapy other times. Some of us might be teletherapy all of the time. And so what I'm gonna present next are three different evaluation models in hopes that regardless of what your fall looks like, you can continue that AAC assessment process. So first is the hybrid model. And this is the primary model that we're using right now in CASC. This is, would be great if you are on site or in school, maybe a few days a week, where you're doing that feature matching evaluation in person. This is when you have access to the equipment. Um, this is when you're able to make those, those small tweaks and, and really add in your clinical expertise into the evaluation. Um, we're finding that this works best when we're considering alternative access or working with individuals with complex motor or sensory needs. Perhaps the facilitator or the person who's going to be guiding that individual through the evaluation process is pretty unsure or uncomfortable with technology. That in-person feature matching evaluation is really helpful. We are then transitioning those individuals into teletherapy for the rental period and for ongoing therapy. And Kat and Abby will talk a little bit later, but we found a lot of benefits in doing that. But if you're not having any time in person with an individual, that is okay. Um, the first model that you could attempt via teletherapy would be a simultaneous model. And what I mean by that is you're doing a single evaluation session, but you're trialing all speech generating device options in one visit. Okay, we would be prepared here to be together for at the very least an hour, maybe two hours, maybe longer, depending on how you schedule evaluations. What you're going to need to be able to do here, though, is ship multiple devices to arrive simultaneously. OK, um, one model that we're attempting in our clinic is for individuals who might be able to use direct touch on a tablet, sending an iPad loaded with three different speech generating applications that might mirror the software available on dedicated device options. This really allows the individual and act have access to three different software programs on a single system for that evaluation piece. And then we can go ahead and recommend that dedicated device next. You'll also wanna do a pre-planning meeting with the facilitator. I would recommend doing this without the individual if the individual might be a child or somebody who wouldn't be taking control over the operational aspects of the device. We really want that um, support person to feel comfortable not only loading the different softwares, but transitioning between them. Again, this works best if that individual can sustain participation, um, perhaps if they have less complex needs, just in terms of the amount of equipment that needs to be shipped. If that lovely simultaneous model um, isn't going to work for you, I would recommend the sequential model. And this honestly, looks a lot like our in-person evaluations for complex um, communicators, where we might be doing multiple evaluation sessions before completing the feature matching process, perhaps trying a single device um, per session or maybe across multiple sessions before introducing a next one. Again, you're still gonna need the ability to ship multiple devices. However, it's gonna take a little bit less coordination in making that happen, right? You might have company A send device one in September, and company B send device to in October and so on and so forth. The important thing to remember here is when you get to the end of potentially month three, it's gonna be really hard to remember what happened month one. So I would recommend identifying some messages or situations to trial on each device and taking detailed notes. So for example, maybe the, the goal is for the individual to communicate three, for example, for the evaluation process, three messages. And we are gonna write down really detailed notes on how efficiently, effectively, and independently that individual is able to access those three messages on all three systems. We might also be taking notes on how many communica communication functions the individual expressed, or how many times they initiated, or how their language skills advanced during that trial. That way, when we get to the end of potentially a three to six month evaluation process, we can remember how it began and make an informed decision. So the barriers exist. The barriers exist in regular AAC evaluations, and they also exist in teletherapy evaluations. Um, a common one is the facilitator struggles with technology. 
Um, I'm pretty confident that everybody on this call struggles with technology in some regard, and that's okay. I think normalizing it is important, but I might recommend choosing a hybrid or a sequential model where that facilitator isn't tasked with presenting three devices in a single visit. That's a lot of pressure. And really taking advantage of those pre-planning visits. I would recommend inviting vendors to those as much as possible if you are trialing dedicated systems. Not only do the vendors have incredible expertise and knowledge in their equipment and the technology, but it allows you to maintain that speech language pathologist relationship with your client and their family where you're really the expert on their language needs and implementation and teaching strategies and allowing that technology piece to be addressed by the experts from the companies. Access to technology, huge barrier for completing evaluations. I realize we're very lucky with our current setup and having access to a loaner library, but the technology is also available to you if you don't have access to that currently. Contact your vendors. They have dream loans for SLPs, complimentary loans for clients, funded rentals for clients. Many vendors have their personal set of devices they might be able to lend you. Check with your district. Maybe you have a large loaning library of devices that might just be sitting there if your kids are at home. You could partner with clinics offering in-person evaluations if you really think that hybrid approach might be best. We're partnering with speech pathologists across Wisconsin um, who are sending their students for an evaluation, they're attending via video, and then we're transitioning care back to teletherapy through school once that equipment is in place. Many of the dedicated speech generating device options out there have comparable speech generating apps. So you can look at that and that might be an, a faster way to send an app out. There might even be a free trial that a family could download on their iPad if they have access to that. And definitely don't forget about low tech. Um, of course, we wanna be trialing high tech systems as we're recommending it, but you can gain a ton of information about symbol type, symbol number, symbol layout, color coding schemas, just by presenting low tech boards. That can really help you narrow it down when we're, we're thinking about what to mail to families. The last barrier I wanna mention is when an individual struggles to sustain attention in teletherapy. This is my almost entire caseload, and I'm sure it is the case for many of you on this call today, that it is rare for particularly children to want to sit at a computer for a 90-minute evaluation. That is okay. There is no prerequisite skills. There is no level of attention an individual must exhibit to participate in an AAC evaluation. We just need to adjust the model we are using in completing the process. Again, I would recommend hybrid or sequential in this case. I think it's unrealistic to expect an individual to participate in three trials and you just might not get the information you need. Here more than ever, we're gonna be doing pre-visit planning before an individual joins so we're maximizing their time, right? We don't want mom struggling to turn on vocabulary builder in the two minutes we have the child's attention. We also might take, an, take the shift um, to a focus on caregiver coaching. Let's identify together ways that we can trial a device throughout a day and perhaps videotape that, right? Send mom around the house with a GoPro or set up the iPad at the kitchen table. And, uh, and if family is willing to send you securely the videos, you'd be able to evaluate those later. I think having an opportunity to see the child use a potential device in their most natural environment during identified functional communication opportunities is just as valuable, if not more, than trialing it in person with them. And really, don't be too hard on yourself and, and make sure the facilitators feel, feel comfortable too. Our goal with an evaluation is not to figure out what insurance is gonna buy today, right? We're trying to narrow down options. We're trying to identify features we need, and we're really just looking for something to rent. Just because you rent it doesn't mean you have to buy it, and you can always do another rental. Right? The goal is to just begin introducing things and narrowing it down. Um, I'm gonna get this turned over to Kat, but I want to mention that all of the companies have responded so amazingly to COVID-19 and published exceptional supports. And so please check out all of the different resources. There are companies that are sending out not only devices to try, but even an iPad for the family to participate in a tele-AAC evaluation. Um, we have mount companies sending evaluation kits. Um, it's really quite wonderful. 
there is one last resource I want to mention is that feature matching chart here at the bottom. This is a great tool to help you think through that process of narrowing down which devices to send, as well as for taking detailed notes during your trials. So I would definitely take a peek at that. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Kat to talk about treatment. Oh, right, everybody. So I am going to be chatting a little bit about treatment. Sarah, thank you for all of that wonderful information about assessment. Let's see. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble getting the slide to go. There we go. Okay. So just like we talked about different models of assessment, I think that there are definitely different models that we see um, in treatment. So I think one of the, the great things is picking that model and thinking about what's going to be best for each client. Um, there are a lot of models out there, but the one that I've found um, that discusses, I think, most clearly what we're seeing as being successful is Rachel Maddell's um, presentation from Practical AAC. She talks about direct, consultative, coaching, and hybrid models. So that direct model is just what it sounds like, um, doing something very similar to what you would do with an in-person session. You're really working directly with the individual who's using the AAC device. In consultative, um, you're doing a lot less of that kind of direct therapy with the client and working more with parents to provide um, quick ideas for things they can trial for the next month, doing some troubleshooting, some brainstorming on how they can continue to expand success that they're already having at home um, to really incorporate um, more communication into their day. In the coaching model, um, we may be really looking more at um, working with the families. Um, so how are we giving them specific feedback, either in real time or after they've sent us a video of how they're using the device with their child, um, to make sure that we're supporting them in learning some of those really key teaching strategies like aided language stimulation or expansion. Um, and then the hybrid model, of course, is a combination of the above. Um, it could really be that you're doing pieces of all of these within your approach. And so similar to what Sarah kind of talked about, um, I think that there are definitely different features that we want to consider about when we're picking different models. Um, and so for the direct therapy model, I definitely might be looking more at a client who can sustain more attention um, and has a caregiver who's really willing and able to participate or at least willing and able to get them set up, make sure the technology is in place and make sure that the individual can really stay in one location, whether that's um, staying within, um, you know, at the table or staying within the same room so that we're able to kind of maintain that uh, visual on camera. Um, the direct service model also may be better with a more established system. So um, if that individual has already gone through that feature matching process and is feeling a little bit more confident in their use of the device. The consultative model is really great to use with um, communication partners who are more knowledgeable. So um, if a family is pretty tech savvy um, and they understand some of those operational components, like how do I add a button? How do I delete? How do I edit? Um, having those kind of established pieces can be really helpful in building on what success they're already seeing and just providing little ideas for how they can continue to expand use of the device throughout the day. In the coaching model, um, I think this can be really great for someone who's still completing that feature matching process or that we're still working on customizing that system. Um, so when we're doing that feature matching, being able to make sure that the caregiver is really involved in that piece is really key because we know that um, systems are more successful when the family and all of the individuals in that person's life also embrace the system. And so making sure we're really coaching them through how it could be used or how we can try it throughout the day um, is going to be a really key part of that. Um, and then finally, the hybrid model can be a really great model um, when we're looking at someone who might need both direct, but then also have some indirect time with the um, caregiver to make sure we're doing some of that coaching. And so on the next few slides, I have kind of resources that I've found to be helpful. Um, like Sarah said, there are so many resources out there and so many wonderful presentations um, that have kind of been developed since the beginning of March. And I think 
Um, these are the things that I found most helpful in my therapy, and I'd love to know kind of what else other people have found helpful too. Um, for me, I always try and think about if I had seen this person um, in person before, what kind of things did we like to do? Um, if we like to play more board games like Pop the Pig or Candyland, um, I might bring in some of these PBS Kids free games. So I'm in control of um, the screen and I might mute the volume on it, but then we can really still use that communication device to be talking and um, playing through those games. Animated shorts are also so amazing because a lot of the times there are no words and there is no audio that goes along with it. Um, and so narration and really talking through what you're seeing, how they're feeling, what we think is gonna happen next, can be a really beautiful way to integrate some language therapy into using the device. For books, I love to use Tar Heel Reader. Um, there are a ton of free and accessible books. So if your individual that you're working with is using um, switches or even um, pieces like that, then we're able to have them access the book and participate in that. Um, and finally, um, despite my very silly drawing of a caterpillar, um, I found that the whiteboard and just built-in drawing features can be very fun. Um, you know, playing Pictionary or using it to um, make a story together can be a really powerful way for clients to be participating. And then, of course, I think all of the vendors have wonderful resources. Um, I think that they all have really great like pre-made lesson plans for you, incorporating the vocabulary that your student is specifically working with. Um, you know, I think one of the things that can be really tricky for all of us all the time um, is that there's not enough time in the day to very meticulously plan every session. And so I love being able to go on and say, you know what, my student today has been really interested in Play-Doh. I'm going to go on to the Active with AAC um, and pull out that Play-Doh lesson plan and use that to help guide what words I'm modeling. Um, and so those can be really great too, because they can also be really great carryover for you to provide for families. Um, as you've been using them and modeling them, then you can also just give that to the family, send that to them for free to be able to follow up with that the next week. When we're thinking about the consultative model, remember we're doing maybe less frequent check-ins and really we're just um, helping to guide the parents through um, using the device without maybe more of that hands-on coaching piece. And so for this, I just love to give families resources to start to kind of think and reflect on their own um, about ways that they can continue to incorporate the device. Um, there's a year of core that talks through um, different core vocabulary to use every month. Um, it has a book that goes along with it. The book is online so that you can watch a video of it or you can read through it. Um, there are also typically activities that go with each word. Um, I also love to use this um, choosing activity by core vocab. Um, I love being able to see what kind of activities does the family do together? What kind of things are you modeling? You know, are you mainly modeling some of those verbs like um, at mealtime? Are you modeling eat, drink? Um, and then looking at how can we expand that to other communicative functions? You know, what kind of um, descriptors can we bring in and what kind of questions can we ask? And then really helping families to expand their idea of how to use the device during those times. Um, the Pathways to SnapCore First can also be a really great resource. It provides in-app um, videos of how the device could be used. Um, and kind of scaffolds you through different levels. So that can be a really great parent-directed app. I also love to always come back to the AAC competencies. Um, we know that to create successful AAC communicators, um, we really need to develop skills across all of these competencies. And so I love to go through this with families and really reflect on where are you seeing their strengths and where can we help build up um, some more strengths in these other areas. When I'm looking at the coaching model, I love to pull in one technique that I'm using kind of each session. So um, Hannon's It Takes Two to Talk has a lot of really wonderful acronyms um, that I pull in. So the OWL technique, observe, wait, and listen, um, or the SPARK technique, which is a really great way to um, encourage communication within routines. So start the same way, plan your child's turn, adjust the routine, repeat, 
and keep the same end. I think using some of these acronyms sometimes, I love to model these for our families, model how I'm doing it, and then use this common vocabulary with them to talk about um, how they're doing um, when you're watching and coaching them. Another really great model um, is the s'mores model. Um, and so, for example, if I was talking with a family, um, as I was watching them uh, model with their kid, I might say, you know what, I loved that you were using a slow rate of speech. I love that you modeled um, that you were what you were saying, say like, I liked uh, to play bubbles. Uh, one thing that you could do is think about how to expand that a little bit more. So let's look at that E a little bit more this next time um, and think about how you can add in, it's my turn to blow bubbles or your turn and really help them to do some of those pieces. Finally, when I'm thinking about coaching, I also love to bring in a lot of um, videos that um, are already made and talk through some of those great uh, teaching strategies that we're using. So, um, for example, aided language stimulation. Sometimes I'll watch um, this video at the beginning of my session with parents and then talk through how this might look in their day, um, you know, based on what they took away from the, from the video. Um, I also wanted to mention that the Mailman Center for Child Development um, in Florida had some wonderful videos um, that explain a lot of different AAC techniques um, for children um, who are bilingual in English and Spanish. Finally, um, I also like to consider other communication partners. Um, a lot of the time when we are thinking about the coaching model, um, I think we focus on parents or caregivers, um, but we also forget about all the wonderful natural communication partners they have built in, like siblings and maybe even extended family members. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Tiemann Bork at the University of Kansas has a really great model called Stay, Play, Talk, um, where she really coaches peers through using a device um, and helping them to use the device with their sibling or their peer. Um, and so I would encourage you to look into that a little bit more if you do have siblings or peers available for that. Finally, the hybrid model. I like to think about doing this before, during, and after the session. So. Um, before, I'm choosing some target words and some activities that I know I'm going to be able to really model those words in. Um, during the session, I'm starting by showing where the word is, giving some really clear directions. Then I'm leading the first activity and showing how I might model that word. And then finally, I'm encouraging that caregiver to model um, the word the next time. Finally, at the end of the session, I like to decide with the caregiver what we're going to practice before the next session based on what we tried. So, for example, this might look like I want to choose the word here. Um, and so I'm going to start the session by showing where I found here on the device. Um, and then I'm going to model here every time it comes up in the book, Polar Bear, Polar Bear, what do you hear? Um, then after we're done with that, I might um, ask the parent if they have any questions about the ways that I modeled it, and then ask them to do um, either read Polar Bear, Polar Bear again, or to lead an activity like Old McDonald, where we talk about what animals we're hearing. Um, and then finally, I like to decide with the parent kind of what they're going to work on in the next week, thinking about that word here. So, um, for example, they might choose to do a listening block. So getting to the barriers quickly before I turn it over to Miss Abby here. Um, so you would be surprised how often um, this barrier occurs, um, but where the student or the child that you're supposed to be working with is not actually present for the session. Um, and so I think that this can be really helpful, um, like Sarah said before her assessments, to do that pre-planning visit with the caregiver and to really set clear expectations. Um, so setting how long they're going to need to be there um, and how long, whether you're going to need both the parent and the child, or if you want to talk to the parent first and then the child. Having a really clear kind of plan for each session can be really helpful. Um, and really just developing this at the start of the school year, you know, just a set model that you're always going to use um, can really help build routine. Um, another one is when the um, caregiver might have difficulty modeling or locating vocabulary. Um, so with this, I like to start a session by modeling where I might find the vocabulary 
or I choose maybe a more limited amount of vocabulary and really pull on the parents and the caregivers to ask, what kind of vocabulary are you hoping to work on so that we can make sure to pull that in. Um, I typically will download the free communication software. A lot of the vendors um, and a lot of the companies offer free versions of the software so I can share my screen and make sure I'm helping the uh, parent walk through where to find things. And then really using visual cues um, when you're modeling. So for example, um, some of the visual cues that I found successful are adding kind of a dark border around the vocabulary that I'm gonna target. So in the um, picture on the left, I have a darker border around go, stop, up and down. Um, or in the picture on the bottom right, um, really changing the color of the button just for the session, just to show which ones we're gonna be using. Um, the top right picture also has some great built-in features. Um, on the PRC Accents, a lot of the time they have those vocabulary builders, um, which help limit the number of vocabulary to only those that you might need within a certain activity or those that are based on the first 25 or 50 words that children acquire. Helping to kind of narrow down and find where that vocabulary is, I think is half the barrier. And then finally, um, I think just like we saw in assessment, having a, a client who has difficulty maintaining attention can definitely be a barrier with intervention. Um, and so one of the things that's been really helpful for me um, is pulling on a lot of my psychology um, friends and using a reinforcement inventory. So finding what is most motivating to this child. Do they love to be moving? Do they love to be eating? Do they love to be reading? Really looking at what is gonna be most motivating and how can I make sure I'm developing activities um, and using more naturalistic things that are gonna be exciting for you so you wanna stay there. Um, and then also planning sessions to occur during daily routines can be really helpful. Um, at meal times or at specific play times, it's just natural that they might be um, confined to a more, um, to a smaller area so that we're not necessarily moving around quite as much. And finally, I think my, my last big thing is to always remember that communication is supposed to be fun. Um, and so if it's feeling too stressful or too um, overwhelming, I often just go back to how can I remember that this is supposed to be a really fun thing and that's going to be the most motivating piece. So now I'm going to turn it over to Abby to talk a little bit about parent and teen coaching. Thanks, Kat. All right. So this is going to be a little bit different. I know um, Kat discussed some aspects of teen, um, parents and teen coaching within that direct therapy service side of things. For us, this is actually two separate things because we do have a program that's entirely dedicated to training for family and teen members. And so I'm going to dig a little bit more into kind of what that piece looks like. Oops, sorry. My mouse is a little slow to wake up. <laughs> So we know and the evidence tells us that there are lots of benefits to providing parents and teen coaching when we are working with individuals who use AAC. In order to provide really family-centered and consumer-driven services, we need to involve not only the individual who's using AAC, but also those people around them. And when we think about the types of participatory practices we use to do parents and teen coaching, this can really actually be enhanced through telepractice versus being something that's harder to do. So some of the advantages are that we can involve the family more in decision making when we're you know, tuning in with them through telehealth services. We can find out what the family's strengths are and really utilize those to continue to drive uh, success forward. And we can develop families' capabilities through their active involvement in their natural environments and natural routines so that the learning is just that much better, both for them and for the individual who uses AAC, because we want to remember that our end goal is always to improve outcomes for those individuals. And so we'll dig a little bit more into different considerations when we're providing this coaching through telehealth. Um, and I will use the words parent and teen coaching or communication partner training pretty um, interchangeably throughout the rest of the talk. So what are the considerations that we need to think about when we're providing this training? Obviously, we have to think about what we're teaching. So what strategies and skills do the communication partners need to learn? Which instructional formats are we going to use to teach those skills? 
and especially how are we teaching them specifically via telepractice. And so these considerations are important whether we're doing in-person or telehealth services, but we'll definitely talk more about what we've used as strategies to address or to make these decisions and think about these considerations in our practice with telehealth. The first consideration related to what we're teaching is important because we need to identify not only the skills and strategies that we're targeting for the AAC user, but also what we're targeting in terms of the communication partner's needs and strengths. And one way that we always start with this in our outreach program is to gather information about those current skills and needs, both through talking to their partners and the stakeholders. They can give really useful information about their experience communicating with the individual, what it looks like in their real world interactions. But above that, it's also important to observe interactions because we have our own clinical expertise that we can add to what we're offering and recommending in terms of parent and team training. And so obviously stakeholder important or stakeholder um, opinions are really important, but our clinical expertise is also important in terms of looking at really useful and supportive strategies that we can teach to our communication partners. We also need to consider where they're at now and how we're gonna move them forward. And this needs to be individualized. There isn't a one size fits all training manual for how to implement AAC with any particular user or any particular um, family and team. And so it's really important that we're talking with the team and getting to some consensus about the different goals we have. It's also important to come to agreement on those goals in, you know, kind of together as you talk through it, because that buy-in is really important in terms of successful implementation and making sure we truly are addressing those family and client-centered outcomes that we talked about at the beginning. Uh oh My mouse is stuck again. There we go. So as we think about the consideration of what to teach, I've included a few examples from Buchelman and Light's latest edition of the AAC textbook that I think a lot of us use um, or have used both to inform our practice or within coursework. Uh, they have some really nice uh, information in this latest edition about family and team training and supports. And so I pulled out a few targeted strategies and skills that we might focus on and I thought about what, what makes these uniquely positioned to be addressed through telepractice? So as one example, when we think about setting up the environment to foster communication, we know that this is important to support individuals who use AAC by creating environments where they can be really successful. And when you're providing those services or training via telehealth, you have a unique opportunity to explore their natural environments and really look at what opportunities and what barriers are there and help work through those so people can get really useful practice setting up and fostering that communication. Another example would be thinking through how we prompt, or I'm sorry, how communication partners prompt as required to ensure the individual who's using AAC is successful. And so thinking through um, kind of what Kat was describing where we are helping families to implement things across environments, when you're there via telepractice during different routines or different activities, it creates this opportunity to coach families in real time and provide them the level of scaffolding that they need to use um, queuing hierarchies or fading prompts out or whatever it is that we're addressing in terms of how they're interacting with the individual using AAC. We also need to consider what instructional formats we might use through telepractice. And I think that this is important to consider not again, just like when we're thinking about what to teach, we think about it on an individual basis. It's the same way with the instructional format. And not only is it individualized for the client and the family or team, but it should be individualized based on the skill that you're teaching. Some instructional formats may be more conducive for teaching particular skills versus others. So for example, in face-to-face -face telehealth, this is not, when we say face-to-face, -face, we're not talking about in-person, still via telehealth, but this is that real-time live where we're tuned in together on the same WebEx or whatever it is. Um, and so in that situation, you can really individualize the session to that individual and you can get very hands-on. 
So ahead of the session, you can identify a particular strategy or skill that you're going to target. You can do it together. You can model that strategy for the communication partner. You can trade places and role play them using the partner while you act as the, as the AAC user. Um, so it gives a lot of flexibility in terms of how you individualize the practice. It does present some barriers related to scheduling. You have to be, you know, you have to find a time that you're all available. And then the prep time to get ready for that can be more. Another example of an instructional format you might use is creating online trainings like this one that are on demand. So after today, this training will be recorded and it will be available. And so you could watch this again at midnight in your pajamas while you have ice cream as a midnight snack if you felt like there was a piece that you needed to review again. It can also be done self-paced and it's repeatable. So not only could you watch it again, but you could share it with another communication partner or another coworker, and they can also watch and learn the same tools and strategies. Uh, one disadvantage of that online on demand is that it's often not as personalized because you're creating a tool that's useful for lots of different people. And you might miss out on some of the accountability. If you give, if you talk to a parent or a team member about watching a particular training before your next face-to-face -face session, because you're going to review that material and practice it, you know, there's not necessarily the same level of accountability to make sure they watched it or that they watched all parts of it and didn't skip through. Um, and then just in time is another format that I think is really useful for some strategies. And the idea with this is that you're almost creating a video model for the communication partner. And so they're watching a short clip of the communication strategy or skill that you want them to use right before they go ahead and use it with that individual. So for example, if you wanted them to target how they are um, supporting the person to go into a library and get a book, which this is probably a better example, non-COVID time, <laughs> But you might take a video of you of you doing that with a client or you doing that with an individual who uses AAC and you video the ways you go in, the queuing levels that you use, how you fade prompts back, and they watch the communication partner strategies that you're using on that video right before they practice doing that same activity. And so what's nice about it is it's very meaningful because they watch it and then they turn around and do it. It has the same kind of evidence-based or support in terms of learning when we think about using video models for, you know, for example, individuals with autism who might be doing something for the first time or have trouble doing something. And so it gives you that really meaningful context right before you go ahead and do that same thing. But it can take time to make those videos and the generalizability can vary. And so I think as you go, as you think about providing this parent and team training, you wanna be thinking about which of these instructional formats is gonna be the most useful, not only for that person, but for the particular skill that you're teaching. Then the last consideration we'll dig into is how to teach these different things via telehealth. And so in our programs, we like to use the strategy instruction model, which is shown here. And this was originally designed to help teach learning strategies to individuals. So how do we learn? It's since then been adapted to be used as a strategy both for AAC intervention with individuals, as well as as an instruction model for communication partners. And so this framework is definitely a great way to target communication partner training because it's, it's been shown to support both effective and lasting change in how communication partners are interacting, as well as supporting those better outcomes for the individuals who use AAC. And so when we look at this list within the strategy instruction model, these are the different steps you go through. And some of them stand out a little bit as kind of feeling like they'd be easier to address by telehealth. For example, when we think about describing, oral rehearsal, and planning for generalization, those are kind of more discussion-based pieces of the model. So those steps you could do over a video conference, you're describing why you're using a particular communication strategy and how it will help the individual who uses AAC. You might be um, practicing and having the person teach back to you and talking about how they might use those across different situations. So those feel a little more obvious steps um, to be a fit for telehealth. But what about the parts of this, uh, these steps where we're actually modeling a targeted strategy for communication partners, and then we're using those strategies within controlled and advanced practice opportunities. 
So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about some resources for how you can do this if you're providing parent and teen training. The first one we'll talk about is the step where you have talked through a communication strategy and you're going to now model it as the partner so that the person you're training can see how they might use it as well. And so I've just pulled out a few different ones um, to talk about because it can be difficult to think, how do I model this from afar when I'm not in the same room with the communication partner and the AAC user and I don't have their device here? Well, one example would be um, when we think about that aided language stimulation piece that we were discussing, how do you provide that input and how do you show other people how to provide the input? Just like Kat talked about using, a, using editor software and screen share can be a great way to pull up the actual communication pages of the individual you're working with and you can use your screen to model how to find language. Another example for modeling targeted strategies um, is to model how often and how long should a communication partner wait or provide an expectant delay to allow time for the, for the person using AAC to communicate their turn. And so on the video uh, telehealth, practice, or telehealth visit, you might actually use some self-talk to highlight what you're doing. So for example, if I'm holding up my iPad and I'm modeling a strategy and then I'm gonna stop as if I'm giving that wait time or that expectant delay, instead of sitting quietly and not saying anything, I might actually kind of whisper to myself so they can hear me saying, okay, I'm looking at you because I'm waiting to see if you're gonna say something. In my head, I'm counting to eight. And so you're giving them that self-talk to build their awareness of how long should the pause be, what can I say to myself in my head to extend that pause and give that wait time. Another cool tool that you might use is a, an on-screen timer. So this is an example of a chess timer actually. And so in chess, when one person takes a turn, they hit the knob and then it switches the timing over to the other person. But in this application, you might switch when it's your turn as the communication partner versus when it's the um, person using AAC's turn. And it gives you a count of how long was I waiting. And so you could use this as a way to give communication partners clear feedback about what they're doing with that strategy. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of just keep moving here. This is another example of ways to create context by sharing your screen or creating visual scenes so that you have more of that shared context as you're communicating with a an individual. Okay, there we go. So then the next step that you, that might be hard to think about how to do it in via telehealth is the, is the step where you start to do some controlled practice. So in that first step we just talked about, I'm acting as the communication partner and I'm modeling the strategies that I might use when I'm interacting with someone using AAC. In this step, we're actually reversing those roles. And so over the video conferencing tool, I might be pretending to be the augmentative communication user, and then the communication partner is the one who's now using the strategies and practicing those um, steps. But the trick with this step is that we as the instructor also need to be prompting and giving feedback to the communication partners about how they're using those strategies, if they should you know, increase their use if they should try a different strategy. So how can you be both the AAC user in your role play role, as well as prompting and giving feedback to the communication partner? Well, one thing that I like to do is use visual supports on my screen. So I might be sharing my screen if I'm working with a, with a family member on how to use a prompting hierarchy and when to go up in prompts or when to come down in prompts, I might share my screen with a visual like this. And in our interaction on the screen, I am staying in my role as the person who is using AAC and I'm responding to their communication partner strategies as the AAC user. But on my screen, I might be giving them a quick reminder like, oh, here's a good moment to use a verbal prompt for me. So it creates an opportunity to serve both roles and help them kind of with that visual where you're not stopping the interaction in order to give the prompting and feedback. And then the last step that we'll talk about that could be difficult to implement by, or could feel difficult, difficult to implement by telehealth is this more advanced practice step. So in this step, 
um, in person, typically the individual or the communication partner would be going out and they would be in natural uh, settings and environments and they'd be practicing those skills and strategies that you've taught them. And then you continue to provide that support and feedback, but you're fading it back. And so um, when you're doing this via telehealth, one thing I found really helpful is to schedule your telehealth visits during real life routines and then ask the family to set up their tablet or their laptop more so you can kind of be a fly on the wall. Like the laptop's not, if they're, let's say they're having dinner and you're observing and giving some cueing about using the device within that routine, don't set it right on the table, right next to them where your face is in the middle of their conversation. Set it up a little higher where you can see both communicators and the device and you can kind of be watching what they're doing as a fly on the wall to provide some feedback without really intruding into the routine. You can also use earbuds to give some real-time prompts and coaching within the in the moment where the client can't hear you, but the parent or team member can. Um, and I think some universities are starting to do this within their training programs where the clinical supervisor is in a different room watching over video, and then the student clinician is in the room with the client getting some like in their ear feedback to support them. So that could be another cool way to support the family on the fly while not intruding into that more advanced natural practice setting. Um, and then another strategy that I found really useful is to use the recording features of your teleplatform so that you can review afterwards and you can use reflection strategies. You can provide lots of different types of feedback. Um, for example, sometimes you're, you might be affirming the things they do or asking them to evaluate what worked and what didn't work. And then you can do some planning in terms of what they're going to practice between your sessions and what what setup you might do for your next session in order to keep practicing these skills and moving them forward. And I know we're getting close to the time, so I'm gonna just pop through these barriers really quickly so that we can have time to hopefully answer a couple of questions. Um, but just like Kat and Sarah said, technical difficulties are always a tricky thing. And so I think leveraging the teleplatform's resources, so if you're using WebEx or Zoom, using their support websites can be important. You can also set up test rooms where families can go into the software and they can kind of play around with muting and turning the camera on and off before you're actually in the session to help them get familiar. Another barrier we've experienced when we're doing this training is a, a mismatch between the family and the provider's expectations. So for example, I often get feedback that the family is really overwhelmed and they just don't feel like they can do this because they just have so much going on. And especially right now during COVID, just things are not kind of quote unquote normal. And so one thing that it's important to do is really break down what you're working on into tangible goals and have some targeted practice opportunities. So rather than ending a session by saying to the family, okay, now you're gonna practice modeling language within routines. Instead, you might say, okay, we practiced modeling, go and stop and fast and slow while you guys were riding on um, your kiddo's adapted bike. So between now and next session, I want you to pick two other routines where you can practice modeling and using go, stop, fast and slow. For example, in the swing, or if you're um, driving in the car, as much as you can do that safely. You might also need to focus on how much sessions focus on discussion versus practice. So sometimes we get stuck in this pattern where families and team members are asking lots of questions and the entire training session just becomes a discussion and we don't really get that hands-on practice piece. So don't be afraid to jump in and say, okay, can you grab your kiddo, grab their device and grab um, you know, some bubbles and we're gonna practice this right now. And then make sure you are discussing and agreeing on the targets and desired outcomes with the family because that really does help with that buy-in. And then this is kind of similar to what Kat and Sarah also mentioned about familiarity with the devices and the page sets. So leverage some of those the vendor websites in terms of the training on-demand trainings and um, resources for family and team to get more familiar with the devices. And then I think another important thing is not to get so focused on AAC programming versus the actual implementation. Leverage the vendors to help families understand how to program buttons and change things on the device, but try not to get sucked into that operational piece because when we think about family and, and team training as SLPs, our purpose is to help with the communication competencies and build that functional communication. So as much as you can, try to focus on, on that actual implementation piece. 
Okay. I'm sorry. That was such a whirlwind. Um, here's a list of our resources, which is also available in the handout. And then we're going to put our contact information up so you can reach out to us if you have other questions. But I think I can stay on and I think we have one minute. So Heather, if there were any questions in the chat, we'd be happy to talk about those now. You guys were awesome. Thank you so much for all of this wonderful information. Um, and yes, we'll do a couple questions, but the biggest question was um, some hyperlinks for the resources and we have compiled those and we'll get those um, out to you in the follow-up email. Um, so everyone who was asking about those, um, you will get those resource links. Um, a couple of the questions that came up, um, any suggestions on how you're receiving videos securely from parents? Mm. I can talk about um, that. I think that was in the, the uh, AAC assessment piece. This is Sarah. We use um, UW Box, which is just a secure box system that we have here. Um, I'm not sure, Kat or Abby, if you have any other secure video sharing platforms that you've been using. Uh, this is Kat. I can say that I was using um, the same thing, and then I often have been using like a um, a waiver or an agreement or something with families too, just to say like, this is where you're gonna be sending it, but know that it's just gonna be used um, for me for treatment purposes. Perfect. Um, another question that came up, any um, suggestions for the technology resources for doing the direct modeling, mirroring versus um, splitting the screen? Do you have any suggestions on that? I like to use, um, so we, with our with our outreach program, the only platform that we've been approved to use right now based on just our university's decision about their HIPAA compliance, things like that is WebEx. Um, so that one doesn't have a ton of functionality in terms of like splitting the screen, but I do think the screen share has been um, pretty simple. And so you can't share multiple things at once, but I do a lot of like, I will, ahead of the session, I'll make sure I open up, like if I'm going to share a website and I know I'm going to use my editing software and I have a video of a strategy that I want to show them and then discuss, I make sure I queue all those things up on my computer ahead of time and then I just bounce between sharing one and then we're talking about it, sharing the next. We've also made sure to give permission to families and teams to share their screens so that, um, like for example, even going back to the video sharing, I've had a couple of families where they don't actually give me a copy of the video, um, but they, within our session, they share their screen, play the video for me, and then we talk about it. Perfect. Well, thank you, um, all three of you, for sharing this valuable information. Um, we also wanted to remind everyone there is a, a survey as you leave, and um, there will be a follow-up email. Uh, give us about 24 hours. Within that, there'll be a link for the recording of the webinar um, on our PRC and our Saltillo brand YouTube pages. And all the resource links will be sent out in that as well um, as your certificate of attendance. So thank you again. A reminder um, to get those in in 15 days if you're using the ASHA CEU registry. And thanks again. Have a wonderful afternoon.